Good morning, everyone. Um, so, just uh, today's class, is, as I'm trying to always uh, run this course, is Fridays we will be doing more interactive problems. And uh, as you saw on the website, there's the, uh, we'll work a bit on um, designing a centrifuge for a video clarification process. Um, I just want to quickly uh, recap a bit of yesterday's material and then go on to the new material and wrap up the section where we get there. Um, so just a quick recap from yesterday. The, the principle of um, central fusion obviously is we're, we're relying on accelerating those particles away or separating them out through centrifugal force. That force that we're able to apply to those particles is much, much greater than gravity. And as a result, the unit size that we achieve with these uh, centrifuges is much smaller than we would have had through sedimentation by gravity. You'll see that actually today's uh, beer example will we'll design what the equivalent sedimentation vessel would have been to separate that beer, uh, the yeast from the beer, and you'll see it's, it's just excessive, right? It's bigger than the whole of JHE's building would be to treat such a small volume of liquid. So then we're going to say, well, look at a centrifuge that's much, much smaller. And that's, that's the advantage of centrifuge. It's we're accelerating those particles through a much higher force field than, than gravity. So the, the base unit that we consider our derivation from is the tubular ball centrifuge. So as, as mentioned yesterday, we, we have our feet coming up in the center over here. And that feed splits to the left or the right in this image, obviously this is a circular, circular hole. Um, and then here we have a vertical wall of water, of, of liquid. So that liquid stays literally vertically due to the tremendous amount of force applied to it. There's, that wall of water is of height h, that we are at the top constraints the, constraints the liquid to height h. And that vertical wall occurs at radius r1. That r1 is the distance from the axis of the center that we keep in our base. The total wall's diameter uh, radius is r2. So the worst case would be a particle that enters at exactly r1. And what we're aiming for is to discover what flow rate of liquid we add to the centrifuge. So the centrifuge operates continuously, we're continuously adding new feed. So this liquid over here is gradually moving in the upward direction. And the amount of time that that liquid spends in the centrifuge is what we call the residence time, or in this notation here, T subscript T. So the total duration with which a particle or liquid particle it stays in centrifuge is that time duration TT. What we're, we can adjust TT, obviously, that's, that's probably one of the main criteria we can adjust in centrifuge is the rate at which we add new material, that volumetric flow rate, determines how long those particles stay in the centrifuge. Obviously, if we feed new material to the centrifuge so rapidly that the particles don't get a chance to, to reach the wall, those particles are just going to be washed out with the liquid discharge. We can always feed it as slowly as we like, and then all that will happen is that the particles will definitely centrifuge out, but then our throughput rates are going to be low. So there's definitely a balance that we, we want to have. We don't want to feed so fast that we don't achieve the separation that we like, nor do we want to feed so slow that we have to buy multiple centrifuges to achieve the separation. So that integral uh, that we had yesterday, we can integrate that and solve for the time tt for the worst case, which is a particle starting at R1 and landing up at position R2 by the time it reaches height H. So that's what we solved for yesterday. And what we calculated there is, using the relationship between volume and that time in the centrifuge, we can calculate a flow rate that you know, we shouldn't exceed. We go above Q max. Um, if we do go beyond Q max, particles of a certain magnitude DP will be washed out of the centrifuge. We go slower than QMAX, obviously we're, we're fine. But what we said then yesterday is, well, that's a little bit uh, excessive. Because it's clear that a particle, that even if, even if it didn't reach R2 within that time, let's say that that particle reached somewhere over there within the time T, it would still be retained by the centrifuge, given the geometry of the mirror. So we went to a slightly uh, less 
excessive design criteria, and we call that uh, Q cut. So this is the volumetric flow rate to achieve a certain cut size. And now our integration limits, instead of going from R1 to R2, we're going, our integration limits are from R1 to halfway between R1 and R2. So really all that gets modified is this denominator term inside the model. We compare the equation for Q cut versus in the denominator here we have log of R2 as R1, and here we just have the log of twice R2 divided by R1. So, so it's a very slightly different formula. And in fact, this denominator here will, uh, will be smaller, and so as a result, Q cut is a larger value. Okay, so I'm, I have a little bit of a bad notation, I was just realizing that this morning. Uh, Q max makes it sound like that's the maximum flow rate. That's the maximum flow rate for a given particle size. That's what that intention is. But it's not saying that's the maximum flow rate ever that we can put through the centrifuge. Uh, in fact, if we're now changing our integration to between halfway between R1 and R2, Q cut will actually be a bigger number than Q max. So it's just saying that we can't actually handle a larger throughput in the centrifuge than what we would have designed for otherwise. Is that clear? That's that explanation. This is uh, this is an important topic to understand. Is what what are our, our free parameters to to adjust in designing the So We're going to use this now uh, when we do that example with the yeast clarification. Okay. Any, any doubts on this? Let's clear them up. This is what today's class is for. It's a bit more relaxed um, question and answer. Anything that's anything that's not clear, let's let's make sure we understand. I, you could arbitrarily choose a different two-thirds, one-quarter, three-quarters. Um, half is the convention for most of these designs. You'll always see factors of two everywhere in, in solid fluid oscillations. No, the intention is you still, does, you, you still create the full weir. The weir still runs all the way from R1 to R2. Okay. Um, we're just saying we're, we're designing as if the particle would land up at R2. At is the midpoint. Obviously, um, we're still actually over designing because you could technically design for a particle that reaches just over there, just shy of R1, and it's still be okay. But then you're saying, I'm 100% confident that my theory applies. There's all sorts of errors in our estimates of rho, of omega, of the viscosity, and so it's, we still want a bit of over design factor. So this seems to be a comfortable number that gets used. So we then we then can take that equation for for uh, that's on the, on the previous slide over here. So Q cut uh, this quite messy equation: the volume divided by the, the residence time in the in the in the um, unit. So let's be clear here: the volume term is that pi r squared uh, r squared uh, r two squared minus r one squared times height. That's the volume term. All the rest of this over here, that's actually the residence time in the react in the in the centrifuge given those new limits of integration. So all this term over here, that's T over T cut. Okay. Then if we if we apply this uh, idea of multiplying and dividing that equation by 2G, we realize that one of the terms factors out to be Stokes uh, law for particle settling under gravity, which uh, just as a recap from the previous slides is, is that term over there. So simplifying this a bit, we get Q cut is equal to two times the terminal setting velocity under gravity multiplied by sigma, where sigma is that, uh, that term over there. And the nice thing about sigma is it's, pure, it's a pure function of the geometry of the centrifuge. Nothing else. It's how we operate the centrifuge, omega, and the geometry, height, R2 and R1. <coughs> Which is why it's so useful for scale up. So what we would do is, if we're designing a, a larger tubular bolt centrifuge, we would take a laboratory scale tubular bolt centrifuge, where we know sigma A from the lab's scale centrifuge, we know the lab's radius and height, and the speed at which we operated it in the lab, and we, can, we know that for that lab operation, we can then calculate what Q-cut uh, would be. 
Then we say, well, we're designing a much larger centrifuge, still tubular hole. It must be the same type of centrifuge with the same material running through it. We can calculate then for a given design Q cut, back calculate what sigma is. And once you have sigma for your larger scale tubular hole centrifuge, then you have four free parameters to estimate what that large scale tubular hole centrifuge looks like. So now I have sigma for my large scale tubular hole. I have to simply select the values of those four parameters, omega, the height, R1 and R2, to help make sure I at least meet or exceed the, the desired signal. Okay, so you've got four degrees of freedom to, uh, to, design your, um, to design your centrifuge. But you actually have fewer than that, because you don't have an infinite number of choices of R1, R2, H and omega. What you would do is, once you know the signal you're targeting, you'd go get the vendor's catalogs or websites, and they sell certain discrete sized centrifuges with given radiuses R1 and R2 and heights, and you go and iterate through those until you find one that achieves the sigma that you like. Your main three parameter that you'll actually end up using is simply omega. You'll pick it for a given centrifuge, and then make sure that you can pick a reasonable omega to achieve your desired sigma. That's your degree of freedom that you really have here. For, 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 to target a certain signal. Okay. A few confused faces, is that not clear? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so pick a, pick a, a, a node centrifuge from a catalog R1, R2, and H, and then calculate the city or omega, the speed at which you want to operate that centrifuge. Obviously, there's certain bounds which are, are reasonable, and the vendor will tell you also what its uh, range of omega is. Okay, and then we moved to uh, well, the last class we, we just had a little video then to describe what the, this newer type of centrifuge, this disposable centrifuge is. Uh, this is the one we're going to look at a bit today. So we have our feed coming in, and as you saw there in the, in the, in the animation yesterday, we have this hole in the middle. Uh, that hole it really serves a very similar purpose to the way that the feed well in a sedimentation vessel serves. It's, 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 pure, it's just purely the entry point for the material into the centrifuge. And the heavier particles and, or, or heavier liquid, if you're doing a liquid-liquid se separation, the particles or the heavier material will, will, will obviously move to the edge. But the main advantage of this whole centrifuge is simply the increase in volume that we've achieved. That's, that's why a, a disk whole centrifuge would be used. There's a few other advantages, obviously. But the main, main reason is that the throughput that we can get through a centrifuge this equation Q is the volume divided by the, the resonance time. That's a, a fixed equation that applies to all centrifuges. It applies to every actually engine, every engineering vessel you design. Uh, this equation holds for. So if we can increase the volume in our centrifuge, we can increase the throughput. And hopefully then buy a smaller centrifuge for, for a given throughput is what, what it comes down to. So we really do want to maximize the volume of that centrifuge. Now, for a, if we go back to the illustration for a tubular wall centrifuge, back to the regular one that we have up here, that volume is, refers to the volume of the liquid. So we've got this open space in the middle um, that, that reduces our volume. So if we can do, fill all of that with liquid, um, we've, we've drastically increased our volume. And that's, that's the principle here of the disk wall centrifuge. We get a, a much greater volume through that centrifuge. And then those extra inclined planes ser serve as extra surface area against which we can capture the solid particles and guide them towards the edge. So, so that's, that's, a, that's the, the, one of the principal reasons for this whole centrifuge. Um, the other reason is because it's closed, uh, we get no contamination from outside environments. And we can run it continuously, as you saw in the, in the animation yesterday, uh, or, or, or you could run it um, in batch-wise mode. It's obviously just going to be, you're going to put a lot, a lot more solids in there to clean out. So. But most often run in continuous mode, and the main advantage is that it allows for totally asymmetric operation. So you'll see it in, in products that are destined for human consumption. Uh, so oils, fruit juices, other beverages, beer, uh, wine. Wine, for example, can be clarified in this way as well. So here's the design equations that we're going to require for today. The, 
typical rules of thumb for these units are that those discs are angled between 30 and 50 degrees. So uh, uh, just be careful when you read the literature on these, uh, on these units. Sometimes that angle refers to the total angle between this cone and that cone. So that, that would be called 2 theta, that angle. But so theta would be the angle between the vertical uh, axis and the, and the cone itself. So just, just be aware, sometimes they call it the half angle, um, but theta is, is what you're referring to in these notes, is the angle between the vertical axis and the cone. So that's typically ranges between 35 and 50 degrees. There's about 50 to 150 discs per unit would be uh, the two extremes on uh, various designs. And then those diameters of the vessels uh, range between a very small 15 centimeters to, to a meter. So the radius would be about seven or eight centimeters to half a meter radius of the cone. And typical rotational speed zero to 12,000. So these numbers are, are, are what we need uh, when, when we're designing the unit because we're gonna calculate a sigma and then find how many disks should we specify? How, what angle should they be at? Um, what speed should we operate the unit at? So these, these numbers up here give us guidelines to ensure that we, we pick a reasonably sized centrifuge. And the other, other thing to realize is that it's typically used to treat streams where the solid speed rate coming in is, is around 15%. So there's the sigma factor for this centrifuge. This is a, a, a really messy calculation if you want to derive it from first principles. Um, Basically, if you, if you do want to derive it, it's, it's asking what is the, the particle um, that I think it's the particle starts over here and lands it over there, and it calculates the residence time. Oh, sorry, it's, it's sorry, a particle that starts over there and lands it at that edge over there, so from R, R2 over there to R1 over there. And so that's why you, the, the angles, and it's, it's really a messy, messy uh, derivation. So we'll just use the result that sigma is, is given by that. And then, then we, we, we use the same principle as before, one to put sigma, uh, just going back to these calculations up here. Um, this equation over here applies equally well to, to this type of centrifuge. The volumetric flow rate that we can put through the centrifuge is two times the terminal setting velocity under gravity multiplied by sigma, obviously a different sigma for this unit. Simply replace the one sigma for the other sigma. And so this is common in, in centrifuge design. There's a number of other alternative centrifuge types uh, which we won't consider in this course, but each one of them has their own sigma calculation. Okay, so just before we head and uh, go and design that the one that we're doing in class today, I just want to mention here a few things. There's obviously uh, a big issues around safety the moment you've got an object rotating at, at high speeds. Uh, one thing to realize is this object, uh, this centrifuge will rotate beyond what's called its critical speed. So the critical speed of a unit is the speed at which it will operate and reach the same resonance frequency as the unit itself. So uh, it's the standard thing you see in physics with that common narrows bridge waving in the wind. So it reaches its resonance frequency. As you speed up that centrifuge and you get to your desired omega that you're targeting, you will pass through that critical speed. So the design of that unit so that it damps out those that as it, as it passes through that is, is very, very important. Um, so there's a lot of safety issues about how this, this, this device is damped and, and, and bolted to the ground so that it doesn't rip itself apart. Um, there's also issues on materials of construction. The forces that are experienced on the walls of the centrifuge are, are extremely strong. We've, uh, you've, we're going to many times gravity, as, as you've seen in, in the very first few slides there. The number of Gs we're putting this device through is, is extremely high. Any minor amount of corrosion on those walls can generate and turn into a big problem for you down, down the line. So critical issues are obviously good welding, and uh, good materials of construction that are not going to corrode so that they can withstand the forces over the whole lifetime of the unit. Um, you may uh, need to consider heat removal, especially if you're treating a, a biosensitive material. With this high amount of rotation, there's a lot of heat generated and, and that, that may become an issue in some, some units. 
the issue of balancing is very much related to the, the concept of passing through its critical speed. And then how we, we get to manage and run these units is, is really only due to our advances in the, in the past years on controllable hardware. So PLCs and SCADA hardware to control the, the, the units and to monitor for excessive vibrations and to adjust for them in an automatic way. There's no way that you can do this in a manual, in a manual type. So PLCs are, are simple feedback controllers, PI control loops, PIE control loops that, that at extremely high rates will adjust the frequency of the drive on, the, on these centrifuges to make sure that it operates in the desired manner. And then we've got a higher level of control SCADA systems, uh, supervisory control and data acquisition systems that, uh, that monitor the PLCs as well. Safety interlocks are even another higher level of, con of control instrumentation on these devices. These are, are simple interlocks that just prevent someone from opening the lid um, while it's still rotating and, and, and things of those nature. And then what we're seeing quite a lot is uh, companies that now install cameras inside their units to monitor the sedimentation buildup and then trigger an automatic stop for operators to come and clean the unit up. So that's, that's quite a, quite a technolo technological leap because you've, you've got a camera now in a wet environment and it's still able to, to, um, to monitor effectively. And then if you've got flammable fluids, or especially if, you, if you're doing a bioseparation, you may have a solvent in then uh, issues related to flammability, you then have to have a nitrogen bank. So safety is, is, is quite a big issue and, and, and a cost factor when it comes to these hits. So screening on, on, the, on the material, uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, I mean, I know in companies that I've worked with, the rule is if a mechanic is working on a machine, he or she has to count for every single nut and bolt before they turn the machine on. If there's anything missing, they do not turn it on. Yeah, there's going to be like devastating effects. Um, but yeah, there's no reason why you couldn't put a, a pre-filter in as part of your hazard study, identify that a pre-filter to a pipe is needed. Well, for these units, I, I, the, the, that may not throw the balance off quite as much as um, that. The laboratory side, yes, but for a large industrial unit, that's going to be a minor deviation. Um, just related to this, actually, it's, it's interesting. We spoke at the start of the class yesterday about those uh, gas gas centrifuges for separating uranium. How many of you have heard of Stuxnet? So, SCADA systems on, on process control plants, these are plants of oil and gas refineries. Every industrial facility that we know of uh, in certainly North America, will, or everywhere in the world pretty much, will have a SCADA system on it. These systems are often very poorly fireable and, and separated from outside the company. So what happened was either, it's not clear if it was the Israeli operatives or the US uh, intelligence agents, uh, they created a virus that specifically attacked the SCADA networks of the Iranian uh, government's um, centrifuges for U-235 and U-238. So those vertical centrifuges we showed earlier, those centrifuges require extremely careful control to keep them in balance and running at those very high rotational speeds. So uh, <coughs> whichever agency in the US and, and Israel, they wrote a virus that specifically targeted the PLCs and SCADA systems for the Iranian uh, nuclear industry. And what they did was uh, they made the control loop make the, it rotate very fast above its design speed and then very slow and then very fast and very slow without telling the control loop that it was doing that. So it told the control loop I'm controlling at target, but in behind the scenes it was going too fast and too slow and it caused those units to self-destruct. Um, and noticeably set back the Iranian nuclear power, uh, nuclear um, effort. So, so that it achieved what they wanted to achieve because of very poor uh, security on their PLCs and SCADA systems. Now that's not to say this could never happen in North America. The reverse could easily happen to us. If you look at any company, most SCADA systems and PLCs are very poorly firewalled uh, with almost no virus software or any um, sort of security on that. And any virus could have more devastating effects than, 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 than what was achieved over there. I mean, 
an electrical system or a, a hydro power generating system can be made to do fairly destructive uh, things on an automatic basis. So, so that's just a cautionary issue. It's an interesting story kind of related to centrifuges and how um, uh, the safety there is quite critical. So just to wrap up here then, uh, one thing just to put up is recognizing that there are many different types of centrifuges. How do we go about picking some of them? Well, there's two parts here to help guide us. One is to use the known effective particle diameter. So I've, I've emphasized the equivalent particle diameter and effective particle diameter. So that's what we just spoke about uh, back on Tuesday when we were looking at particle size distributions. Pick a particle diameter, the equivalent particle diameter, even though you're not working with spheres, but find the equivalent spherical particle diameter, and then come down this table and, 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 and find the appropriate type of separating unit. So here's the tubular mold unit that spans a, a wide variety of particle size diameters, which is one reason why we discussed that. And then here's our, our, our disk type centrifuge that we looked at this morning. They span a similar range, uh, but obviously they're the advantages that they allow for aseptic operation and for continuous mode operation as well. The other plot to, to, to use is uh, this one, which is for a desired throughput of Q in meters cubed per hour, so slightly different non-SI units, so meters cubed per hour on the y-axis, and then use units of twice second velocity under gravity. So simply calculate your Stokes second velocity under gravity multiplied by two in meters per second, and then find the appropriate um, region of the plot that you're in. Notice here for these particles that separate with fairly high velocities, there you wouldn't be using a centrifuge using gravity separation. So this whole part of the plot is blocked off. Uh, there's a lot more sensible units to be using if you're in that part of the size distribution with low flow rates. The moment you get to higher flow rates, you're going to get an excessively sized gravity tank. You may want to consider centrifuging. Okay, so, so this plot makes a lot of sense. There's unfortunately not too much available for extremely low, uh, slow particles at high throughputs. Other than here, you're in the laboratory style uh, centrifuges. Those we can we can we can separate very very small particles in the lab at unfortunately low heat. So this this part makes a lot of sense. It's always worthwhile to kind of double check the design and make sure that it's, it's, it's reasonable cases. Okay, so let's work on this problem for a few minutes. Um, actually, for the rest of the class, the idea here is we're going to design a separator for for this clarification and. You can be as, as fairly creative with this answer, in fact. There's no one correct way of doing it, which is what design is, is usually. There is no right answer. There's a more cheap answer. So here we've got a, a company that's producing beer in batches of, of 100 meters cubed in a large fermenter, and they have four such batches per day that need clarification. Now there's yeast suspended in this liquid. Uh, the density of the beer itself is roughly about a quarter of the density of the yeast cells, very, very close to the fluid that they've suspended in, which is often the case in bio separations. The particle sizes of those yeasts are given to us of a range from four to six microns. Which size do we pick for when in our design would be one question. Um, there's a certain mass of, of yeast suspended in that, so that gives us an idea of the, of the percentage solids we're dealing with. And then obviously aseptic operations like that. So no doubt in anyone's mind here which type of centrifuge to use. The question now is, what should be the size of that centrifuge and how do we even go about designing it? So just to put this in, in context, this is exactly what I'm going to be looking at for the project report from you later on in the end of the term. So here, the reason why I picked this example is because it's easy for me. Um, it was when I did my project in separation processes at Aachen University of Cape Town. This was my project here. And it's exactly what uh, we're going to go through now. But, okay, so here we go. Okay, yeah. So there, <laughs> South African breweries, was with, I was designing it for, we're designing a centrifuge for this. This data that I've given you is exactly the one um, that I did the design for. And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll post this for you on the website. The intention is to show you this is the 10-page report that I'm looking for. 
for this project uh, at the end of the term. Uh, it's a 10 page report that starts by saying these are the types of units available to me, this is how I design and size that unit. So it's a very, very small report and uh, that's, that's what we're after. And you can do this in groups of two, you don't have to do this on your own. So back, back to this, this is exactly the same problem that we did in that design, but we're going to do it now in 20 minutes. You don't need a week to do this design, it's actually fairly straightforward given the, the equations we've got. So get, let's get started. I'll, I'll be moving around and we'll be talking about different options and then we'll summarize it.
So we want we want an understanding of the geometry of the unit. What if we if we that's what we're after, how are we going to get the geometry? What are we going to use to do? Is 
designed for low end, high end, and middle end. If you're designing for the high end, though you're going to leave all your low end stuff in the bottom, in the, in the center, in the, in the supination. So you can actually even design for smaller than four. You can design for three and four. And then see what the difference is between the design for three and the design for four. So there's no need to click follow your design these criteria rigidly. Right? There's, a, there's a very much a creative step in, in, in design. So we can design for DP um, in the order of three times 10 to minus six meters if we wanted to. Uh, what are we going to use for Q? If you want to do like an equivalent flow rate, so you have 100 meters Q comes four batches divided by one day. Okay. okay, so that's implying you're operating 24 hours a day continuously. Okay.
0.25 meter radius and uh, 0.1 meter radius. Those come from also those uh, general constraints that we know the size of the systems are generally between 13 centimeters diameter and half a meter diameter uh, and one meter diameter. So these two numbers are comfortably in the two If you want to be a bit more careful, I can go look up some vendors' catalogs and find a unit that's similar to size. And then my main degree of freedom is my rotational speed in RPMs, for which I can calculate my sigma, make sure that my sigma at least exceeds my target, and then I'm done. And then I just do a final check to make sure my solar percent is within the typical solar 